So, right, the name of the talk today is going to be What Can Traditional Web Application Security Can Learn from Browser Wallet Extensions? Now, while this talk is, while this title is a little bit long, I think it's really spot on in terms of like what we're going to talk about today. So, allow me to go through the agenda real quick. First, we're going to focus on uh, traditional web applications. So we'll talk about the centralized architecture um, and the security advantages that it has. We'll do the same trick for the decentralized world. So we'll talk about decentralized web applications and the security disadvantages that they introduce. And then we're going to talk about how the decentralized applications fill in the gap security-wise in order to become secure as well. And we'll also cover what does this have to do with the web, um, which would lead us to talk about a really interesting project that we're working on in the team called Lava Mode, which is basically an interesting way to sandbox dependencies. And we'll summarize by understanding whether the traditional web app security um, industry can learn from these initiatives and adopt. And what can you do about it? So a lot of things, but I'm going to make sure that it all relates to each other. So first of all, I want to, I want to make sure that it makes sense to you. Why am I the person to talk about this today? So for those of you who've been um, for, in my talk yesterday, this is going to be very familiar to you. But my name is Gal Wiseman. I've been doing browser and client-side JavaScript security for a long time. And I've touched a lot of different aspects. Um, so I started off doing offensive security in terms of like browser and JavaScript um, when I served the 8200 cybersecurity unit. Afterwards, I worked for this small startup focusing on retrieving ads that were blocked by Adblock. So a lot of extension security there. I did some client-side bot detection and supply chain security in the browser at the well-known web security company called Perimeter X. And I also did some bug bounty and anti-debugging research. So I managed to breach services like uh, WhatsApp Web, Chromium, Sneak, and many others. Um, make sure that you don't confuse spare time with the name of a company. I'm literally talking about my own personal time. And what I'm trying to say is that I always been focusing on the client side of things, but it was always from the perspective of securing the server side, right? Because the server side is really the entity that has all the assets that we want to truly defend. So even if you ship security to the client side, it's usually in order to defend the true asset, which is the server. But now I have this unique job in which for the first time ever, I focus on securing the client side in sake of the client, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. So I work for MetaMask, which is a browser extension that acts as a crypto wallet, and it's a self-custodial wallet, which means that the secrets are all stored in the browser. So I do supply chain security there, runtime security, job security, all these aspects that have to do with this concept. So first of all, I want to make sure that we understand the classic architecture of the traditional web, uh, web apps. So all of this is something that you should all be familiar with, pretty basic stuff. You have the classic architecture. So you have the authentication layer, which is in fact like you know being able to register and log in to a service, right? Um, and then you have the authorization layer, which basically means that you should be able to you know access resources that should be yours or be able to perform operations on your behalf. So whether it's you know reading messages that were sent towards you, or maybe change your profile picture uh, if we're talking about services like Facebook. So these all fall under authorization. And what you need to understand about this is that we're talking about a centralized architecture. So that means that the server really has all the control. We need to make sure that we understand that the server always has the power to revoke or limit access or permissions to your user. Um, I will controversially claim that your users in the centralized architecture aren't really yours because when you think about it, they're associated with you, so you can access them at any point, and the service um, promises that you're going to have access to those at any point, but technologically, 
the service, such as Facebook or any other service, can take that privilege from you at any point. Um, because they can decide that you shouldn't be able to log in, they can ban you for some reasons, they can mitigate the your ability to perform certain operations, because everything happens on the server. The server has all the control. Now, I want to focus on the advantages of that, um, security-wise. So first of all, this is a great paradigm for protecting the user. So what do you mean? Consider the following example. Um, ATO stands for account takeover. So imagine, if, if we're talking about Facebook, for example, imagine that um, an, a hacker managed to steal your credentials. They managed to steal your username and password, and they leaked them to a malicious server in Indonesia, for example. So it means that maybe at some point the hacker is going to try to attempt to take over the account by providing the uh, credentials, your username and password, against the Facebook servers. Now, at this point, Facebook has the power to say, well, while your credentials are valid, I can see that you're coming from an Indonesian IP, where usually you're coming from, I don't know, a, an, a US IP, so I'm going to block your access anyway until I understand what's happening here. So security-wise, that's a good thing. And it leads us to the other thing. It, it makes sense that because of how the server really has all the control, the client is in fact an entity that doesn't need to be trusted to a certain extent. So the client is really merely for interaction and the server really got all the power. So we're securing the client but like to a very minimized extent because it doesn't hold actual power. Now let's do the same trick for the decentralized web applications um, world. So we're talking about the decentralized architecture, and you can see here that the diagram is a little bit different. So if you're thinking about authentication, the registration process is kind of a weird one because in the blockchain world, all you need to do in order to become a participant in the ecosystem is just be able to, to generate a private key, right? So if you have a valid pr private key, you're officially part of the, of the system. And that private key is in fact your way to connect to decentralized applications and log into them. On the authorization level, that, things don't really change, so the ability to access resources or you know, perform operations on your behalf are kind of like the same here. And we're talking about the decentralized architecture. So as opposed to the architecture from before, this time the client really has all the control. Um, so it has all the control over the access and permissions to the assets associated with that key. It all sits in the client. So there's no server in the decentralized architecture. There might be a server for some operations, but what really matters is how the client is the private key and it holds the access to what really matters. And because of how the blockchain is really all about enforcing protocols, it means that anyone can participate. So once again, we're going to do the same trick from before and we're going to talk about the disadvantages of this architecture. So this time, the protection of the user is a bit more complex because if we're going to take the same example from before, the account takeover example, then it's pretty much the same example, only this time instead of stealing your credentials as your username and password, what the hacker managed to steal is your private key. Now this is a whole different story because this time there's no centralized entity, there's no server that can help you to block a login attempt, to block a asset transfer attempt. The fact that someone managed to steal your private key is the theft of the assets. It's the theft of the cryptocurrencies, it's the theft of everything that is associated with your account. It is the theft of the account. So there's no server that can help you with that. And that takes us to the next point. It means that the client must become an entity that is fully trustful. So as opposed to before where we had this entity that wasn't that important because the server really uh, could reverse malicious operations, this time we need the client to be trustful because there's no server and the private key and the client are literally everything. 
Um, and that kind of like translate into a single point of failure because if the private key is stolen, your account is effectively stolen. So there's a saying in the, in the cryptocurrency world where if, if you don't have access to your keys, you don't have access to your coins. And it translates here to the fact that if someone managed to steal your key, they effectively stole your account. So before we talk about the gap, I want to make sure that we understand what I, what's the client and what do I mean by a client? So when I'm talking about the client, I'm specifically referring to either the decentralized application, but today we're going to focus on the crypto wallet, which is also part of the client and allows you to do three main things. So first of all, we're talking about a browser extension and it allows you to do um, to, first of all, store your private key. So you can see here how the private key sits within the wallet, right? So it allows you to store it, and it's kind of similar like to credentials. Then it also allows you to connect to decentralized applications that you can visit using the browser. So you can see that here as well. Um, and it's kind of like a login process. And the third thing is that it allows you to interact with the blockchain in order to perform operations. So that's kind of like the read-write thing that we talked about today. You can now use the browser wallet to interact with the blockchain, whether on behalf of your private key or not. So now let's talk about the gap. Because the equation that I want you to remember here is that if the client is now everything, it's your assets, it's your keys, it really matters. There's no server that can help you with that. And you combine that with the fact that the client is a trustless entity according to how the web is currently designed, then it means that in order for the decentralized ecosystem to have a justification of existence, we must be able to harden the client security-wise, which is what we're going to talk about today. So in order to pursue that, we first have to ask what could effectively go wrong with crypto wallets? Now, when we understand that crypto wallets are in fact just browser extensions, so good old HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, um, but they hold um, a precious secret, which is the private key, which is your account. And because of how, as I said, they're actual web applications, very similar to how web apps are constructed, only they have more power over websites, then I would claim that the question that we should ask is what could go wrong with web applications that hold a precious secret such as the private key? So there are a lot of aspects to this question, but the one we're going to focus on today is confinement of code. So let's talk about malicious code execution. Malicious code execution in the context of the crypto ecosystem could lead to access to the private key, and having access maliciously to a private key could translate into the uh, abusing of the private key. Um, so two things that can happen when you have access to the private key and you're bad is that, first of all, you can perform malicious operations on behalf of the key that you just had access to. So you can, for example, sign a malicious cryptographic transac transaction that would take the assets from the victim and move it to someone else. And the other thing that we might be worried about is the fact that you can leak the private key to wherever you want, to, for example, a malicious server, and then abuse it afterwards. So if we're thinking about that, we should focus on the types of code execution. And this might remind kind of like some parts of the talk that we had yesterday. So there are two types of code execution. Um, there might be more, but the two that we're going to focus on today are cross-site scripting. So as I said yesterday, I'm not going to get too much into it, but generally I would controversially claim that cross-site scripting is a solved problem. I'm not saying that we're not going to see it in the, few, in the next few decades, but all I'm saying is that if web applications really want to face cross-site scripting attacks, the web now, for the first time ever, provides you with the tools you need to face such attacks. It's just a matter of properly using them. So that leaves us with another problem that is far more complicated to address, which is supply chain attacks. 
So let's talk about that. So when it comes to supply chain attacks, I would say that the traditional web application security ecosystem should definitely care, but there's a limit to how much they should care. Because the damage that can be made with when it comes to supply chain attacks is almost always reversible because of what we said um, before. We talked about the centralized architecture and how the server really decides everything. So if someone manages to take over your account or move money or, um, ch I don't know, change your profile picture or just like take over your account completely, um, the server as the centralized entity at any point can reverse that action and take care of such a breach. But with the decentralized ecosystem, I think that it should care a lot because the justification of existence of this ecosystem really depends on clients not being compromised. Because damage cannot be reversed when you're the client and you're the holder of your assets and there's no centralized entity that can reverse the action for you and that can take care of, of such a scenario. So we have to find a way to prevent this because as you see the centralized world continue to exist even if there are supply chain attacks, it's just a matter of um, you know, reversing action and trying to um, make things right in hindsight. But in the decentralized ecosystem, if a decentralized um, service is getting breached and everyone gets rugged, no one can really help them reverse the, the assets. And then there's no justification of existence. So this is kind of like a core difference that I want you to, to consider. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we mitigate supply chain attacks in the ecosystem? So I would claim that the most effective way to get there, which is not an easy way, is to confine dependencies, which is also known as sandboxing. So let's talk about some prior art in the realm of sandboxing. So a lot of sandboxing attempts in the web ecosystem are trying to leverage iframes or workers and just try, try to like take the trust the, the parts in the code that you don't trust and maybe place them in an, in an iframe, in a worker. But there are two problems with using these techniques. So first of all, there's the introduction of identity discontinuity. So identity discontinuity in JavaScript means that if you're taking part of your code and you're transferring it to a different realm in JavaScript, as known as like iframes and workers, then it's going to inherit from a different prototype chain, which means that the identity of an array formed in the main realm is not going to be the same as in another realm. Um, same goes for DOM nodes and uh, DOM elements and stuff like that. And that's a problem because a lot of, a lot of services in the web kind of trust the identity of elements to be, to remain the same. So for example, if you consider the instance of operator, it's not going to work if you're going to compare, um, an element to a, a prototype, a DOM prototype coming from a different realm. It's just going to break. So we want sandboxes that don't break compatibility backwards. The second problem is the breakage of synchronicity. So if you move code to an iframe or a worker, then you're necessarily going to introduce another event loop, uh, which means that if there was a atomic unit of code that used to run in uh, as, as, an, as an atomic block, if you split it and move it to another realm, then it's not going to run synchronously, which means that other code is going to execute unexpectedly between these two parts of code, which really changes the flow of the application completely. And once again, we want to make sure that we can um, re uh, preserve backward compatibility. So I think that iframes and workers are not very effective for successfully sandboxing the world of the web, um, which is why we're going to talk about a work in progress called CES, which stands for Secure ECMAScript, and it's really all about hardening JavaScript in order to allow confinement of code 
So currently it's a JavaScript shim, which means it's virtualized in JavaScript, and you just install it as a script tag in your in your application, and it just applies um, the the defense. And hopefully in the future, it'll become a native part of the JavaScript language. So currently it's a TC39 uh, proposal. You can go and check it out. And so what CES does is mainly three things. So lockdown and harden are two elements that we're not going to focus on today. But all you need to remember about these two is that they allow the environment to provide secure sandboxes on top of it, which are called compartments. So we're going to talk about compartments. So not going to go too much into the official definition. You can once again check it out online. But compartments are basically a way to sandbox JavaScript code within your application. But they provide something very crucial. Um, and they're, they're really powerful because they all work within the same realm as the application. So we don't need iframes. We don't need workers. And because of how the sandboxes share the same prototypes and live within the same realm, they share the same built-in APIs. And then the identity discontinuity problem is solved. And the synchronicity problem is also solved because we are having sandbox um, environments within the same realm, which means we share the same thread, we share the, ser the same event loop, and everything really works really as before. So this is really powerful and really revolutionary. And it's interesting if we're, we'll take it back to our conversation because you can use this, the sandbox, uh, the dependencies of your supply chain. So if you take each dependency and you confine it to its own new compartment, then everything is going to work just as before because you don't break the identity discontinuity, sorry, the identity continuity, and you don't break synchronicity. So it's going to work as before, but it's going to be safer because you still manage to take parts of the code and place them in a sandbox environment. And what's interesting about this is that this is not theoretical. So CES is widely used in the decentralized ecosystem. We're talking about a technology that is being developed in the decentralized industry by a company named Agoric. And LavaMote, which is the project that we're working on, is in fact running on top of CES compartments. So let's talk about LavaMote. So LavaMo does a lot of things, but we're going to focus on three simple stages just for you to understand what it does and how it runs on CES. So the first thing it does, it takes each dependency in your supply chain and it, and, and, uh, it statically analyzes it and it finds all the JavaScript APIs that you, that the dependency is trying to access. So, we're going to use an a oversimplified example here, but imagine I have an NPM package called logger.js, and all it does, it exports a function that allows you to provide messages and then log it. I see now that I missed an S there, but um, I'm sure you're going to realize what's happening here. Um, so, a very simple um, a very simple function, right? All it does is just like logs information. So the next thing that it does, it takes the APIs that it found that the dependency is trying to access and it creates a policy that later on will help us to enforce access to APIs in real time. So for example, if we take the example from before, so the package logger.js is going to only have access to console.log, right? Because as we've seen, the only JavaScript API that's being made use of in the dependency is console.log. So we're talking about a whitelist approach. Now, why is this interesting? Because the third step 
is that we can load each dependency within a compartment. We can form as many compartments as we want. So we'll take each dependency, we'll form a compartment for it, and we'll run its JavaScript code within that compartment. And we'll make sure that it only has access to the APIs that it needs using the policy. This, this goes uh, by the uh, POLA principle. So it's the principle of least authority saying that each software should only have access to what it needs access to and nothing more. And the result is that each dependency is confined to its own compartment uh, safely, thanks to SES, and then each compartment is provided with a finite list of the APIs needed by the dependency based on the policy that we just generated and if the dependency get breached, this is the important part. This is where all the pieces fall apart. So, fall in. If the dependency is breached and attempts to access APIs it doesn't normally need, then it won't have access thanks to the policy and the fact that the compartment was not fed with APIs that are not necessary for the dependency. So, the following Example is going to make you understand the whole thing, hopefully. So imagine the same package from before, but you can see here that this time there's an introduction of a new line that was not there before. So imagine that MetaMask, for example, is being breached. So, one, so someone managed to breach the logger.js npm package, which MetaMask depends on, right? So they introduce this new um, line that allows them to steal any messages that we log. Imagine that we, for some reason, log some important information that is sensitive, and under these circumstances, you can see that the compromise of the dependency could be really bad for us, because not only that it does what it used to do normally, it now also introduces an operation that is dangerous. They leak sensitive information to another domain called bad.com. But what's interesting about this is that if you combine it with the policy that you used to have, where the policy dictates that logger.js only has access to console log, but it doesn't have access to fetch, then the, the fetch access attempt is going to be blocked at runtime, and it's not going to work. So it's going to be introduced into the application, but when fetch is going to be accessed, it's just going to throw an exception. Now, when we build the application, the policy is going to update, and it's going to show us a diff. And in the diff, we're going to see that there's a new API requirement by logger.js to a new API called fetch. Now, it's our responsibility to say, Logger.js is a logging dependency. It should not have access to network. So by identifying that before introducing and, and accepting that policy, we can in fact mitigate such attacks before they happen. So that is pretty much everything I wanted to discuss today about Lava mode and everything we talked about, the centralized world, the decentralized world. So I just want to go through everything we talked about and make sure that you understand how it all relates. Kind of small up there, but first we're going to focus on how we talked about traditional web applications. So traditional web applications hold assets and capabilities and precious secrets in the server. It means that security mostly focus on the server, naturally. And it also means that the client is almost irrelevant to secure. I wouldn't say completely irrelevant. Obviously, there are things that might be relevant, but it's not as important. Now, when pulling the same trick on the decentralized ecosystem and crypto wallets specifically, then it's really the other way around. We're talking about assets and capabilities that live within the client. Therefore, security for the client is super important. 
But the gap is how the web isn't currently designed to handle this problem. It doesn't take into account, and for a good reason, centralized architecture allows the client to be safe to a certain extent, but the decentralized ecosystem must harden the client security-wise in order to handle that situation. So we need to fill in the gap and we need to get to a point where the browser and JavaScript and the DOM and the web in general, everything that relates to the client must be hardened security-wise. CES is a really interesting example of that because it adequately addresses supply chain attacks from the perspective of how crypto wallets should address this. It does so by confining untrusted code before it even runs. Lava mode is a really good example of that. So we're using SAS within Lava mode to take each dependency, statically analyze it, and form a, an enforcing policy out of it. And then at runtime, load each dependency within its own compartment and make sure that it behaves according to the enforcing policy. And the result is remarkable. You can get real confinement for, for each dependency away from the application because it lives within its own sandbox with limited access. It only has access to the things that it really needs. Now, the interesting part, I would say, is that the traditional security ecosystem can definitely adopt this um, thinking process and these technologies because proactive security for untrusted code is actually a really good thing whether you're in the decentralized ecosystem or not. Um, it could be useful against script tags and against um, good old NPM dependencies. So it's really useful for this ecosystem as well. And it's not that the centralized ecosystem doesn't have anything to lose. So I said before that a lot of elements are irreversible in the decentralized ecosystem as opposed to the centralized ecosystem, but that doesn't mean that we don't have an actual need to defend important assets in the client because there are important assets in the client when you think about it. You have PII information being exposed to the client. You have actual credentials stored in the client and also, if you're running JavaScript in the client, you can perform operations in front of the server on behalf of the client. So those actions might be reversible, but they're going to be painful either way to the centralized architecture. So in the decentralized world, we're trying to harden the client to a point where things like that can happen um, early on. And I would claim that this is definitely something that the traditional ecosystem can maybe um, be inspired from. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Gal, for the amazing talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions to make? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I think that's very useful. Uh, I have a question about the lava mode policy. Uh, so what I understood is that it is uh, generated uh, like um, by static analysis. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But my question is how frequently should that happen? Like I, I, I'm thinking about two things. First of all, if we don't, don't do it enough, then maybe like our dependencies will have some code changes, some like valid code changes, and then... Uh, like our application will stop working. But on the other hand, if some malicious code is pushed and we just regenerated the policy, it could have like the actual dangerous or malicious action added to the policy automatically. So what's like the right balance to, to generate that file or, or like how to do it correctly? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's fair. Um, so lava mode is, an, is, is a new technology. It's experimental and there are still disadvantages that we're handling. So I would say that the answer is that for MetaMask, for example, what we do is that we compile this, like it's really part of the process, of the build process. So every time you build the MetaMask application, it really takes all the dependencies, but it first 
processes them through Lava Mode. So Lava Mode creates a policy every time we build the application. And on the CI part, if the policy generated is different from the policy that's part of the application, then the CI just stops. And it's your responsibility to look at the differences and tell whether there's something malicious or it's legitimate. Um, also, it's also part of the pull request. So if you introduce like a new dependency or you update a dependency, then you have to introduce the new policy and like the changes there. Now there are a couple of disadvantages with that. So first of all, the onboarding is worth it, but it's complicated. Because the first time you do it, the diff is going to be zero to an entire policy and it could be really big, depends on like the complexity of your supply chain. And yes, you have to go through all of it. But once you manage to do that, then the differences in the pull request and the differences in the CI are going to be, you know, kind of small, and you're going to be able to tell whether there's an introduction to something malicious or not. So the process for us is just, we have pull requests in MetaMask, and by the way, it's open source, so you can definitely check it out. And you'll see that, that a lot of pull requests are introducing um, differences to the policy, and it's the responsibility of both the developer and the reviewer to review those policies to make sure that there's no fishy business going on. All right, thank you. We've got here another question. Thanks, Gal. Uh, this makes a lot of sense, and I, I believe it's totally worth it for uh, MetaMask. Uh, but I would, uh, I'm thinking, and perhaps all the people here are thinking, how this can be applied to like to everyday websites. And I'm thinking about a few challenges. Uh, one is that it requires changing the code in order to use every dependency, like you have to wrap every dependency, and that needs to be done by you uh, up front, I think. Uh, so uh, any hints on how we can attenuate that work? And I want to touch also on the static analysis. Being JavaScript, uh, it might be a challenge to detect everything, uh, every every method, every API that a script might be using, you know, because of how dynamic the language is. And so that might happen to fail, like identifying some some of the APIs needed, and that will break the code. So how you address that, I would also be interested in learning about. And uh, also maintaining the lists of, uh, like, the white list. Um, uh, for MetaMask, of course, like you're doing it right. You're stopping the build, going through whatever fails, and making sure that you are making the, the right decision. But for everyday websites, uh, do you have any recommendation on how to do like the governance? Like, should we stop the build as well? And do you think that in the long run that will like work for most of us? Fair questions. I have to admit that three questions is out of my scope of being able to remember all of them. So you might need, you might need to help me there. Um, so first one I'll address would be so. <laughs> so you're asking how is this going to be scalable for web websites, for example, with your last question. So. I think that for websites it's going to be challenging. I, it's a problem that I'm thinking about a lot and I don't have all the answers at the moment. So for example, for very dynamic websites, um, you know, thinking about um, websites that introduce a lot of the third party script tags and stuff like that and they update code all the time coming from CDNs, it's not going to be easy to integrate lava modes. I agree. But I could think of centralized, um, um, web applications that could definitely benefit from this. So I can think of applications such as, um, you know, Facebook or Instagram, which include a mitigated level of um, third-party code from different CDNs. So as long as your web application uses um, code originated from their own domain and served by them, it's going to be more um, reasonable for them to 
use Lava Mode on top of it. But like websites such as news websites that just fly in tons of scripts from third party places, it's going to be challenging. Now, I don't think that it's going to be impossible, but with the current technology, um, reintroducing policy enforcement for each third party script is definitely closer to impossible. And I think it's going to be a journey to address that, definitely. Um, remind me another question? Right, yeah. This, one, this is a good one because that's a question that I asked when I first joined. I was like, oh, but I can, you know, obfuscate some part of the code and then you're not going to know that I'm trying to use fetch. Or maybe I can take fetch and try to take it out of the window in a more complicated way. So the answer that I was provided with, which is a good answer in my opinion, is that this is a whitelist approach. So if someone obfuscated code, um, and you can't really see the word fetch, then it's not going to have access to fetch. So that's, that's a good thing. And so it means that dependencies need to be rather explicit about the code that they're approaching. And while it might seem like something that you cannot really assume, it's rather successful with MetaMask. And Lava Mode is being used by another crypto wallet as well. And it just works. This part works. Um, dependencies are generally uh, explicit in terms of like the APIs they're going to use when they are legitimate. And what was the third question? Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have? Okay. So my question is about the granularity of the policies. So let's say that uh, I introduce a dependency and it uses fetch, and that's fine. And I trust the domain it's sending data to. Uh, but then it patches up the lib and it's still using fetch, but it's now sending data to an untrusted domain. Uh, does Lava Mode have any granularity of the domain it's sending data to or something like that? Very fair question. It's a good question also. And that's like part of the disadvantages with this approach. Um, it's really good at making sure you don't have access to the APIs you don't need. But if it has access, but if the dependency has access to the, to the APIs that an attacker can make use of, then Lava Mode is not going to be able to stop that attack specifically. Um, I would still say that a big portion of the potential attacks are going to be blocked by this approach because a lot of dependencies don't need powerful capabilities. And also sometimes maybe you have fetch, but you don't have storage capabilities. So sometimes in order to perform a successful attack, you're going to need more than just one type of capability. Um, usually fetch is not going to be enough. But yes, if you manage to breach a dependency in the MetaMask application that has access to all the APIs that you need as an attacker to perform a successful uh, attack, then Lava Mode is going to fail to defend them. All right. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have for... If it's a quick one... Uh... It's a really quick one. Uh, you mentioned that... Uh, says will eventually land in TC39. So that takes me back to strict mode and the decision behind making it optional. Do you think that that was a mistake and do you have concerns about says or compartments becoming just optional features that most people, most websites will not use because of, you know, like friction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a, a great analogy to that is how CSP is such a great mechanism, but in, you know, test of reality, it wasn't fairly adopted by most uh, services, and therefore a lot of websites remained um, unsafe. So definitely a concern. Um, I'm not an expert of, like, what are the right moves to do in order to make people adopt things. I am a technological person and to me usually it's satisfied, like I'm satisfied with the fact that the web allows me to secure my application completely and it's just a matter of choice. 
Um, I'm not saying that integrating Ustrict and CSV and compartments is going to be simple for websites. It, it's not. But I think that websites that refuse to take it, even though it's complicated to maintain, are irresponsible, to be honest. Um, especially when it's introducing uh, sensitive information. So I personally am not too worried about that. I think that the web needs to be um, friendly to how you want to use it. And I would love users to vote with their clicks and not visit apps that are not um, safe enough. So you don't have to use compartments, but like you should. All right. Uh Thank you all, everyone, and thank you, uh, Gal, for the amazing talk. Uh, we're going to be making a, a quick break. We'll be back w at 11.30 for our next talk. Uh, thank you.